Let's bring in Alethea Young from Canner Fitzgerald. But Alethea, uh, we're going to talk about all of the non-COVID pharma news. Uh, but I first want to ask you uh, just to give us your latest view on the state of the vaccine race and what you make of uh, some of the, the latest developments there. Great. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, for me, I feel like the vaccine journey is more of a journey and a marathon than just a quick race. And it's not going to be a one size fits all. So you're going to have setbacks like today. Um, you're going to have successes, I think, as well. Um, but, you know, it's going to be, uh, there are going to be many therapies, I think, available, not only just vaccines, but also antibodies, treatments as well, um, to kind of solve and address, you know, the large U.S. population need here. You know, there has been just so much focus on the race for a vaccine, the race for therapeutics and getting some of those treatments to market that you do really lose sight of what's going on behind the scenes in, in R&D. Uh, the news from Biogen on its advances for its Alzheimer treatment earlier today and then Sarepta's gene therapy. I'm wondering what you see going on behind the scenes in, in biotech that, you, that has you the most optimistic right now. Which names do you like? Well, you know, it's really just innovation is going on at like a profound rate. And I mean, you're seeing it, I guess, the, the Amer typical Americans seeing it through the vaccines and how quickly they've been able to bring drugs that didn't exist from preclinical to, you know, phase three development. But that's actually happening everywhere in biotech. And so you name two things, right? Obviously, Biogen, who now is going to have an FDA panel on November 6th for potentially the first U.S. drug approved for Alzheimer's disease, which would be an incredible step forward. Obviously, a fairly controversial um, name and a controversial um, set of studies they ran where one worked and one did not. I'm very, very excited to see what's going to happen at this um, ADCOM. And, you know, we'll obviously be doing a lot of prep into that. And then the second point with Sarepta Therapeutics also today, they had very exciting news this morning out of a medical meeting in Europe where they have a gene therapy for muscular dystrophy. This, this is a treatment a disease where there are no treatments for kids right now. And they showed at two years that patients were able to show disease modification, meaning like people are functionally getting better, not getting worse. Typically on natural history, patients would get worse. These people are actually getting better, being able to walk, move more and function more. Um, so they have a phase three that's upcoming, obviously toward the end of the year, early next year. So I'm very excited to see that. But obviously we came out a little bit more confident today after seeing that durability at two years for Sarepta. So, so should we expect uh, more M&A in this space? And, and who would be your prime takeout candidates? I mean, I think there's going to be more m and I mean, the reality is, I think companies that are unpartnered late-stage assets are always the names that, you know, are ones that people kind of pay attention to. Oncology has obviously been very hot. Hematology as well. You know, Alethea, I'm wondering how much you think R&D and innovation could potentially suffer from the focus on the vaccine and the focus on COVID and the fact that some of these trials have been delayed. You know, what do you think we can calculate as the cost to some of these companies? Is there any? I think, but not much, right? These companies, most of them are big. And I mean, truly they are having to divert, you know, large parts of effort to manufacturing and getting this underway. But, you know, at the same time, I actively have covered this space for a long time and still follow it. And there's just as much innovation, just as much catalyst data readouts you know, things on track, like when you talked about TG or Arena, both of these companies have like major readouts coming, you know, over the next 12, 12 to 18 months, um, haven't really missed a beat. So I think sometimes people get over-focused on COVID, but the reality is, is that the entire space is moving aggressively with many different modalities and therapies. And that's kind of what the Sareptives of the world tell you, the Biogens of the world, you know, all these other companies are doing kind of completely different stuff, but they just, we don't pay a lot of attention to it because we're trying to solve the world's problems with COVID. Um, Alethea, clearly there's been lots of impacts of the, the stay-at-home trend, and telemedicine is, is one of them that's seen a, a lot of growth of late. Are there implications from telemedicine for your subsector of healthcare? Does it impact the likely demand uh, for drugs going forward? So, I mean, I think we're in a new normal where, you know, doctors at one point weren't particularly comfortable, at least in the U.S., you know, kind of seeing patients virtually. And I think now, you know, even I've been to the doctor virtually, I mean, I think it's starting to become the way of the future. And also, you know, they're getting, being able to get paid by the managed care, which is a big piece of the puzzle. So I do think it's kind of here to stay and it's making the healthcare system more efficient, which ultimately means like over the long term that more volume can go through the healthcare system, which also help, affects all my biotech companies. Alethea Young, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.